ASBIL aims to transform technology-driven smart cities to human-centric smart society with comprehensive and interlinked solutions to improve people's quality of life. Smart Society utilizes ASBIL's digital twin IBMS platform to create smart building automation that supports citizens and clients, not just with data integration, but also delivering committed values through the execution of smart projects. Big data collected from IoT devices in each subsystem will be diagnosed and analyzed within ASBIL's IBMS platform to create smarter facility management with general preventive maintenance, prescriptive maintenance, and even predictive maintenance. The platform uses data to create an identical twin of the physical space into a digital space to simulate and predict possible events in the future, thus providing actionable insights, deterioration diagnosis, operational fault detection, and automated optimal control. Smart building automation improves aspects of facility management by incorporating building information modeling into the IBMS platform. Building users can enjoy improved experiences via smart tenant services from personal devices to request for building services. Smart Experience for VIPs is one of the dedicated applications that can deliver an extraordinary experience for your VIPs as they enter the building through IBMS interfacing security CCTV, car parking, room booking, and smart air conditioning system. Through human-centered automation innovations, ASBIL strives to create a leading-edge smart society. Solving complex challenges is in our DNA. Go back to our roots and you'll see why. Sabana Jurong Group was formed in 2015 through a merger of the consulting arms of Housing Development Board and Jurong Town Corporation, who played critical roles in Singapore's development. Today, Sabana Jurong is a global multidisciplinary consultancy group in 120 offices across 40 countries. We are architects, engineers, designers, planners and specialists driven by progressive thinking. By designing and delivering quality housing, workspaces, roads, rail, hydropower and critical infrastructure, we are redefining cities. Building cities, shaping lives, expresses how every project is an opportunity to fulfill aspirations and enrich lives. Our logo's bold red dot radiates creativity and innovation, emblematic of Singapore, where the group is headquartered. Subana Jurong has grown from strength to strength through transformative acquisitions. The group offers comprehensive consultancy solutions, anchored on sustainability and enabled by technology, to partner communities around the world in building a smart, sustainable and resilient future. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World City Summit 2021. I'm your host, Ken Lee. We're here at the Marina Bay Sands Hybrid Broadcast Studio with an esteemed in-person audience, and we're pleased to welcome you, our online audience who have just joined us from all around the world. In a few moments, I will introduce Ms. Indrani Raja, Singapore's Minister in the Prime Minister's Office, the Second Minister for National Development and the Second Minister for Finance to give her keynote address. This will be followed by the panel discussion for this session, Investing in a Sustainable and Equitable Recovery. Simultaneous interpretation in Mandarin is available in a separate channel. Some of you have already submitted questions to our speakers in advance, but online audiences can use the Q&A function on our virtual platform to post more questions. 
please also participate in our poll, which is on the platform as well. Before we begin, we would like to announce the launch of two new publications from the Center for Livable Cities. Both are from our Urban System Studies, or USS, series. The USS on government land sales documents the challenges, efforts, and successes in conceptualizing and implementing the land sales program over the decades. The USS on Transport is our second edition of this publication, and it provides a historical account of transport policy changes in Singapore, as well as highlights how various dilemmas and challenges have promoted innovation and progress. You can download free versions of these books using the QR codes here, or visit our CLC website. We are very honoured today to have Ms Indrani Raja, Minister in the Prime Minister's Office, the Second Minister for Finance and Second Minister for National Development, here with us to deliver the keynote address for this session. Minister, please. Anis Baswedan, Governor of Jakarta, Mr. Seth Tan, Executive Director, Infrastructure Asia, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to all of you, wherever you may be and whatever time zone you might be in. Thank you for joining us at this World Cities Summit session on investing in a sustainable and equitable recovery. It's been a year and a half, and all of us are continuing our fight against COVID-19 and I hope that you are keeping safe wherever in the world you may be. None of us have avoided the impact of COVID-19. As vaccine distribution continues and the world begins investing in recovery, cities where more and more of the world's population live have come to a few realizations. First, in the face of unprecedented disruptions, we have to increase resilience in urban infrastructure and systems for example, by building in adaptability and flexibility. Second, cities must lead collective global action for a sustainable future. To ensure a healthy planet for both current and future generations, this is not a choice, it's a must. Third, COVID-19 has hit the disadvantaged and the impoverished the most. Any vision for a sustainable future must also be equitable, as worsening inequality will only compromise the resilience that we seek. For cities, taking a long-term view and investing in infrastructure will be the bedrock for this vision of a more resilient future. But what kind of infrastructure do we need? Crucially, how do we fund this infrastructure? COVID-19 has strained national and city budgets, with governments spending heavily on critical priorities such as ramping up public health systems and extending financial assistance to those whose livelihoods have been devastated by the pandemic. That these priorities have taken precedence over long-term infrastructural development is understandable given our current circumstances. But as the world recovers, infrastructural development must be a priority. According to the Global Infrastructure Outlook, a G20 initiative, the infrastructure investment gap globally will widen to at least US $15 trillion by 2040. Developing nations in particular were already facing severe infrastructure gaps prior to COVID-19, and many developed cities need to upgrade existing infrastructure to remain economically vibrant and incre an increasingly vital task as the world recovers from the pandemic. So we must persist. Infrastructure investments are a key driver of economic recovery and long-term growth. Infrastructure is also critical for the provision of basic needs, energy, water, waste disposal, transportation, and so on. All of these things that our, cit our cities and people depend on. How do we close the infrastructure gap? Strained budgets mean that governments can no longer do this alone. Partnerships with the private sector are needed. 
The World Bank has estimated that 85% of the investment gap in sustainable infrastructure will have to be borne by the private sector. Public-private partnerships, or PPPs, where private investors partner with governments and share the risks and costs associated with infrastructure development, are one option that cities can pursue. Aside from cost savings, PPPs can confer other benefits, such as injecting fresh ideas and greater innovation, and reducing project completion times. In Singapore, we have, for many years, harnessed the drive of the private sector to build and improve our city, the government and private enterprise working hand in hand. In some cities, greater involvement of the private sector in urban development does give rise to legitimate concerns, for example, about developers putting profit ahead of public interest. But this need not be the case if governments work with the private sector to design and structure their partnerships well. So, for example, Singapore's Land Use Planning and Conservation Agency, that's the Urban Redevelopment Authority, or URA, carefully stipulates requirements on publicly accessible space and greenery provision through various schemes. These include the privately owned public spaces, or POPs, design guidelines, and the Landscaping for Urban Spaces and High Rises, LUSH scheme. You'll have to forgive us our acronyms. In Singapore here, we, we love our acronyms. This approach sees government providing the planning parameters while working with the private sector to operationalize them. This is just one way government can guide and work with the private sector to develop important infrastructure while still meeting urban planning objectives. Next, what kind of infrastructure should cities finance? In the face of climate change and pandemics, it's more important than ever that cities invest in a sustainable future for the world. The world has been advocating sustainable development for decades. Meaningful progress has been made, but much remains to be done. Investing in sustainable infrastructure is no longer just about achieving environmental outcomes. It also factors in social, public health, economic and financial concerns. Ensuring sustainability in all these interconnected areas enhances our overall resilience in times of disruption. We don't have to look very far for examples. Climate change is the collective challenge of our generation and it will impact the world environmentally, socially and economically. Other disruptions include growing inequality, aging populations, pandemics, and technological disruptions, which will exacerbate these impacts. Infrastructure that integrates these considerations will not only boost resilience, it will, in tandem, also enhance livability, help create jobs, and drive inclusive growth. This is why Singapore believes strongly in the value of such sustainable infrastructure. So I hope you'll let me briefly share with you some of the examples of ongoing projects that we are excited about. We are integrating sustainable infrastructure in one of our upcoming public housing towns called Tenga, located in Western Singapore. Developed by our Housing and Development Board, or HDB, the town will integrate nature and the community so that residents can enjoy nature right at their doorstep. Tenga will have a car-free town centre where walking and cycling will take precedence, as well as spaces for community urban farming and smart features in homes and common areas to save energy. Sustainable infrastructure does not have to be limited only to buildings. Our National Parks Board, or NParks, is working hard to achieve its vision of transforming Singapore into a city in nature. This would further weave nature into our urban fabric and strengthen our resilience against climate change. One of the key steps it's taking is to work with the community to plant one million more trees between 2020 and 2030 under the One Million Trees movement. Under this movement, we have so far 
planted more than 210,000 trees across Singapore since last year. Singapore is also integrating circularity into our urban systems, for example, by cutting waste and boosting renewable energy production. We are aiming towards zero waste, in line with our Zero Waste Master Plan, which was published two years ago. Last year, more than half of our waste was recycled. Most of the rest is incinerated, generating electricity while doing so. We only landfill the resultant ash and non-incinerable waste. To move towards zero waste, apart from reducing the amount of waste we generate, we are also going further and trialling the use of incinerated, of treated incineration ash as an alternative construction material for roads or non-structural concrete. This is what we call new sand. Singapore is also ramping up on our use of renewable energy, in particular solar. This is a key part of our international climate action commitments and will help to boost our resilience against unpredictable fossil fuel energy supply or price shocks. Under the Solar Nova program, Singapore's Housing and Development Board is jointly leading a whole of government effort with our Economic Development Board to aggregate demand for photovoltaic systems across government agencies. The aim is to better achieve, the aim is to achieve better economies of scale, lower costs, and make solar energy even more viable. HDB plans to install solar panels on 70% of our public housing blocks by 2030. The solar energy generated will power common services such as lifts, lights, and water pumps, and any excess energy will be channeled to our national grid. What I have described are a few examples of the kind of sustainable infrastructure that Singapore is investing in to make us more resilient against climate change and other disruptions. But we know that other cities are also making great strides in the same direction, and we look forward to hearing from you on your city's experiences as well. Sustainable infrastructure delivers clear benefits to the environment and impacts communities in a positive way. When the benefits of clean air, clean water, and low pollution are made available to all, this boosts public health and is an important part of a city's inclusive growth. In Singapore, we clearly understand that infrastructure development needs to produce equitable outcomes. Cities must invest in a recovery that does not leave people behind. Around the world, the people hardest hit by COVID-19 live in cramped conditions with inadequate sanitation, which has worsened the spread of the virus. The pandemic has driven home the importance of public health infrastructure to ensure hygiene, sanitation, and access to clean water and waste disposal. These are basic infrastructural needs. Urban infrastructure and systems such as public transport, healthcare, parks, Recreational amenities, as well as digital and internet access, are examples of basic infrastructure that cities must not neglect. Widening access to these is critical to reducing inequality. Singapore's national strategies in these areas have been carefully thought through to ensure this. By 2030, we aim for every household to be within a 10-minute walk from a park, and we will expand our rail network from 230 to 360 kilometers to improve public transport access across the island. In the area of digitalization, we are boosting digital literacy among our elderly. We take the view that no one is too old to learn. We have programs teaching them how to make video calls, search for information online, and protect themselves from online scams. Cities need infrastructure that is resilient, not only to climate change and pandemics, but which also strengthens social resilience 
by reducing inequality. Because when these disruptions and shocks occur, as we have seen, it is the most vulnerable among us who bear the brunt of it. From partnering the private sector for infrastructure investment to pursuing a sustainable vision, to ensuring a recovery that leaves no one behind. These are all very important priorities, and it can be easy to see them as separate agendas, but they are in fact all closely intertwined. It boils down to resilience. To be resilient in the face of an uncertain future with unpredictable disruptions, cities need to invest in infrastructure that is both sustainable and equitable. Cities that succeed in doing so will not only be able to survive, but to thrive. I look forward to the discussion by today's panel to explore and share practical ways that cities can secure investments for the infrastructure that they urgently need. So wishing everybody a, a wonderful conference and thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Let's dive right into our panel discussion on investing in a sustainable and equitable recovery. We're grateful to have with us today Bapa Anis Baswedan, the Governor of Jakarta, who is joining us virtually from Indonesia. Allow me to also invite to the stage our other panelists, Mr. Alfonso Garcia Mora, Regional Vice President of Asia and Pacific of International Finance Corporation, who has flown in to be with us from the United States. Mr. Gareth Wong, the CEO of Midbana, Ms. Tan Su Shan, the Group Head of Institutional Banking at DBS, and our moderator for the session, Mr. Seth Tan, the Executive Director of Infrastructure Asia. I will now leave the next segment in Seth's capable hands. Seth, please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this discussion this morning. But before we start, I'd like to restate the topic that we are going to discuss this morning. And as I, as I stated, I wanted to uh, uh, roll out the opening poll for everyone uh, who are joining us to, to give your comments and your choices. And the poll is what are the challenges in, in ensuring resilience and sustainability of infrastructure projects? If you could take your choices uh, amongst one to five, you can choose one or you can choose more than one. But as we wait for everyone to poll, let me state the topic that we are discussing today. The topic is how can city governments design and structure their infrastructure investments to ensure against disruptions? And what are the development measures and approaches that would best allow governments to ensure the resilience and sustainability of infrastructure projects? Now let us take a look at the poll to see what is the results uh, of the poll. It's quite evenly spread between the five topics, with social political changes featuring a little bit more. I think this very well sets the stage for what we are going to discuss today. We are very honoured to welcome our esteemed panellists to with us, and perhaps I would like to invite each of them to first give us uh, their introductions and, and also to set the stage. First off, may I invite Governor Anis? Governor Anis. We welcome you to set the stage by uh, using three to four minutes. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, peace be upon all of us. Uh, good morning, uh, greeting from Jakarta. Mr. Alfonso Garcia Mora, Mrs. Tan Susan, Mrs. Garrett Wong, uh, Mr. Seth Tan, Mr. Seth Tan, and ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Jakarta Capital City Government, uh, allow me to convey our gratitude for inviting us here uh, to share our experience in the road of recovery, while at the same time uh, addressing the issue of livable and sustainable uh, city challenges. As all of us know, the year 2020 has presented us with unprecedented challenges from the global pandemic, the economic recession, 
and the extreme weather events worldwide due to the climate uh, crisis. It is exactly just as Professor Swab once said, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world. So uh, panelists, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we took this opportunity uh, to create a new urban vision for our city. I think this is happening uh, all over uh, cities across the globe, that we work hard to turn uh, its challenges into enhanced values. We took each problem, trying to find the solutions, and at the same time, we size the opportunity that arises and try to turn them into accelerated change in the cities. Uh, for example, the health uh, crisis teaches us to become a more pandemic-proof city. The economic crisis shapes us to be a resilient city and simultaneously, simultaneously uh, size the digital breakthrough opportunity and expand it for the digitally advanced city. These changes are developed with the intentions for sustainable and livable city. So we believe that the changes that we are working and we believe uh, we will continue uh, to work on wide ranges of impact to our citizens is something of a journey that will have impact in the long run. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, currently Jakarta is working on managing the crisis and restarting the economy. Both has to be done simultaneously and we know it's never easy. There are five crucial stages that we took in ensuring sustainable and equitable uh, recovery. So the key words are one, resolving, two, resilience, three, returning, four, reimagine, and five, reform. So we are resolving the pandemic problem by containing the virus and minimizing the lockdown period. That's one. Two, making sure to safeguard the vulnerable, especially uh, the, the vulnerable part of the cities, uh, to help them bounce back uh, during this hard time. Number three is returning. We return to the everyday life and the activities mindfully with the changes of new normal life. And four, we reimagine various opportunity that comes to key sectors, industries with the changes in order to do what? To reform the way of life in our city in this new normal. So here uh, in Jakarta, we are turning to unite different businesses to protect the livelihood of our people, especially the vulnerable groups, while creating a just policy simultaneously. This is all done with limited available resources, but our government, Jakarta Capital City Government, is working to at least a few things. One, manage various projects for recovery programs, especially that provide large employment. This includes, if I may mention, the Jakarta International Stadium, the flood control, the wastewater treatment plan, the waste management infrastructures, and so on. Two is uh, to develop uh, regulations in accelerating the licensing process for infrastructure development here in the city, cutting permit process from the previously around 360 days into uh, around 50 days. These are reform that we have been uh, doing as examples uh, to transform our city to become a sustainable and livable city. And our work have resulted that we are promoting this more uh, green approach to our mobility. We have now 364 kilometers of revitalized sidewalks, 96 kilometers of dedicated bike lines, and also 52 bike sharing spots across the city to help our uh, residents to transfer from one place to another, especially in the downtown area where we have the busiest uh, activities. 
And then uh, number two is we have seen an increase of number of cyclists in our city. It has increased tenfold, so 1,000 uh, percent in the past uh, few months. And then we are also uh, seeing an integrated uh, public transport uh, through TOD approach or transit-oriented development approach uh, in our uh, main uh, downtown area. And then we have seen that government buildings, private buildings have been installing solar panels uh, in line with we just uh, heard uh, earlier. And then the last point I'd like to share uh, on the result of this approach is we have seen massive development of urban farming uh, practice uh, throughout the city. So this is our, these are examples that when we are enforcing collaborations with various uh, stakeholders within the city, be it central government, private sector, and also uh, uh, campuses, think tank, uh, we are able to unite, we're able to get inputs from all of uh, all sectors. We're also promoting uh, resilient urban collaboration with businesses and non-government sectors to accelerate sustainable and equitable uh, recovery. So we believe that the strength of collaborations, uh, as I mentioned earlier, from cities, nations, organizations, and all stakeholders, the exchange of ideas, the exchange of suggestions from our co-creator has helped us to build a solid foundations for achieving and a complete uh, recovery. Thank you. I hope this uh, set the tone for the conversations. A warm regard from Jakarta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> May I now invite Alfonso for your views and comments to set the stage? Good. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction, uh, Seth, and uh, it's really my pleasure to be here with, uh, with all of you and with this uh, distinguished panel. Uh, as you know, IFC is part of the World Bank Group. We are the private sector arm of the, of the World Bank Group and the, and the global development organization, the largest global development organization focused on private sector in, in emerging markets. We mobilize uh, commercial capital and private sector solutions uh, using both uh, lending instruments, um, but also guarantees or providing advisory services or facilitating uh, PPPs with always a long-term perspective, a long-term partnership perspective. And I wanted to highlight this long-term partnership perspective because I believe that this is one of the key issues that really needs to be on the table when we talk about cities, sustainability and investment. And actually, I think that this is one of the main uh, issues that we need to deal with. How can we reconcile the short-term needs with the long-term vision? And that's not easy because of the different stakeholders that, um, that participate in this, uh, in this situation. And, uh, and I think that cities uh, matter. Cities are even more important than any other, if, you, if, uh, if we want to uh, think about it, than any other uh, uh, framework, because uh, they are Actually, they generate 80% of the GDP, of the global GDP. So at the end of the day, uh, cities is something very abstract in a way. But if you think about what we do with cities or in the context of cities, there is where the GDP of the world is, uh, is, uh, is growing. No? And therefore, we need to have a, a good lens on how to do it. So what is the challenge? The challenge, in my opinion, is uh, the challenge was there before COVID. Uh, and we know that there was already a huge uh, stretch in many countries, in many regions. Uh, because of the rapid urbanization, because of the migration from rural to urban, that has led to a situation in which cities uh, really needed some uh, prioritization, I would say, in the way that they could deal with the social and economic problems that they were facing. No? But then COVID came and made things even worse. Made things even worse uh, because of two different things. One, because of the huge decline on revenues, and uh, we estimate that you know, on average, uh, the, the cities lost between 15 to 25 percent of uh, revenues during COVID. And this is particularly relevant because the capacity that cities have to find different or additional revenues is much more limited than a central government. And therefore, this uh, decline on the revenues that they had limited also the capacity that they had to deal with uh, different investment priorities. No? But the second piece is that there were many things that were urgent urgent and short-term. 
cities that needed to deal with situations, with uh, needs that were really the need that we have now. And therefore, it limited the capacity of the cities to also think long term or to think on capex, think on investments that require to go really beyond the cycle. No? And I think that that created a, 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 significant, a significant problem. No? So more needs and less resources. So typical conundrum that we, <laughs> we need to find out how to solve it. No? How can we solve it or what is, what is the key thing there? No? So I, I will use what we have and now, uh, you know that in the World Bank Group we love the acronym. So now we have a new one, which is GRID, uh, G-R-I-D, which is Green, Resilient and Inclusive Development. So this is the new strategic framework that we have uh, created to respond precisely to the uh, uh, current situation in the, in the, in the, in the world. No? What do we mean? And I would like to discuss on what can we do with cities in this context. No? Green. Why green? I mean, for many different reasons, and the minister mentioned in, the, in her great uh, opening remarks, no? but we have the Paris Agreement and we have the NDCs. And we know very well that every, each single country that needs to commit with NDCs and has committed to deliver on the Paris Agreement will need cities to actually deliver a big part of these NDCs. So we need to change the way in which our internal prioritization in the cities was done. And we really need to bring the green angle if we really want to deliver the NDCs that we committed in the Paris Agreement. So we have to put the cities at the core, at the center of our climate change policy. Resilient, because also as the minister mentioned before, only half of the cities in the world, of the main cities of the world, have plans for climate adaptation. Half of them, less than half of them. So we have 50% of the main cities in the world that do not have any plan for climate adaptation. And we know that this is especially relevant in this region, in Asia, because it's the region that is more susceptible to uh, climate change. So we need, again, to bring the planning and to, green, and to bring the uh, long-term thinking to this agenda. No? Third, inclusive, because we know that uh, by the policies that we implement and the investments at the city level, we can make them inclusive. So the inclusion agenda, if I may, depends significantly on how we make cities inclusive how we facilitate that these cities provide the services and access to services uh, to uh, citizens that can actually be inclusive in the economy. Fourth point is the how, and how do we do it? And this is, of course, the, the critical one. No? How can cities do all this that I am saying in a context of uh, limited public resources, limited fiscal space, huge increase in sovereign debt, and uh, limited capacity to actually find other sources of funding? No? So here is where I would like to bring three, three, three points. One, and probably most important, municipalities cannot do it alone. They cannot do it on their own. They need the private sector. And the issue is private sector meaning private capital. How can we mobilize private capital for this objective? How can we use the incentives to really mobilize private capital? All that amount of volumes and trillions of money that are sitting in institutional investors' funds that actually could be eager to probably be mobilized to something more productive. How can we do that? I think that there are a couple of things that are important. One, to establish the right framework. Today, there are just a few cities in the world that can actually borrow beyond the central government transfers and the, and the, and the public financing, which makes sense or could make sense. So we need to create the framework to allow cities to borrow responsibly to really allow them to go to the private sector, issue bonds, issue loans, and therefore uh, uh, get the financing that is needed. And for that, you need to have a framework that allows that to do it, or, or allows the cities to do it in a sustainable way, which is not easy. I'm from the European Union, and it was a discussion that took forever in the European Union. The level of decentralization of the borrowing capacity, central level, subnational level, or regional level, and municipal level. No? But that's a, that's a need, in my opinion, something that we need to think on, on, how, to, on how to do. But, you know, even if we have that, the framework, that's not enough. We need more than just a framework. We also need standards. We also need capacity. We need uh, uh, incentives. We need requirements. And we need what I mentioned before, a budget and a prioritization that goes beyond the short term, that really allows a, a city to think long term on what are the priorities, what, are the, what is the capex that I need for this, what can I fund with one so, uh, source of, uh, sources of funding, and what requires other sources of funding that probably where I can tap capital markets or other investors. No? I will be eager later to, to discuss about the, uh, some specific case studies, but I think that my main conclusion is we need to put the cities on the grid. We need to bring cities on this green, resilient and inclusive development. Thank you. Thank you. Very elegant acronym, agreed. Perhaps now I'd like to invite the private sector. Um, 
Gareth, what's your views and comments to set the stage? Thank you, Seth. I'm honoured to be here this morning to join my fellow distinguished panellists uh, and to share a bit more about Mibana. Uh, Mibana is a joint venture company of Mitsubishi Corporation, Japan's leading trading house, and Sabana Jurong, which is one of Asia's largest urban and infrastructure technical consultancy solution providers that is owned by Singapore's domestic holdings. Uh, Mibana's mandate is to seed and develop townships, large-scale ones, mass market, in Southeast Asia and South Asia, with the aim of achieving two main goals. The first is to enable good quality, affordable housing that is co-located in economic and employment centers. That is quite a key uh, factor for us to make sure that there's sustainable housing together with appropriate uh, economic and employment uh, uh, centers. At the same time, we also look at promoting multimodal transit hubs, which uh, integrates both public and private uh, transportation options. So in essence, we are trying to focus and promote and enhance affordability and access to the masses. The inspiration for our joint venture formation really stems from the background of our parent organizations, having had a long history and background in the urbanization as well as the industrialization of our countries, Japan and Singapore, over the better part of the last uh, half a century or so. And it's our hope that our platform will be able to export uh, our experience and expertise in helping developing Asia to address the challenges of rapidly urbanizing population uh, as, as we have discussed. So as we know, today's cities uh, are a big contributor towards uh, employment opportunities and more than half of our global population resides in urban centers. That number is projected to grow to 70% by 2050 and the bulk of the urbanites, two and a half billion in total, will come from Asia and Africa. So very definitely, how we think about urbanization and industrialization in the next leg of uh, our economy and global growth will have a profound impact on our urban living environment. Cities today account for more than two thirds of global energy demand, and they contribute 70% of greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide or CO2. In the same vein, transportation actually is the largest energy-related CO2 emissions producer, and three quarters of that actually come from road vehicles. So I think it's our platform's idea to think about how we can transform and redefine urban planning to create smart and sustainable townships and transit-oriented developments, as Governor has said, and, and to think about how to induct private sector capital to be creative about ensuring long-term sustainability and resiliency of the desired outcomes that we seek. By bringing together two very large organizations, we hope to be the benchmark to create and, and be a beacon to work with multilateral organizations like the World Bank and IFC, private sector financial institutions, regional governments, municipalities, to look at addressing and outlining what are the core requirements, the challenges that they need, and localize them. It has to be an organic exercise. It has to be from the ground up that will be acceptable to the people, uh, but broadly with green and social sustainable outcomes. So I'll be happy to share a little bit more about some of the experiments and the ideas that we have in mind. Uh, and thank you again, Seth, for having me this morning. Thanks, Gareth. Last but not least, uh, may I invite Sushan to give her comments and uh, set the stage. Thank you for having me. So at DBS, uh, we have a motto, which is BBBW, which is to be the best bank for a better world. Uh, sounds like built back mm -hmm. better. <laughs> and I will, um, I'll take a leaf out of Alfonso's uh, speech and also uh, talk about the, the why, what, how, and what's needed and the challenges. But as the banker on the panel, I guess I'll, be, I'll bring a capital markets and, and, and financial prism to this. So first of all, the why, right? I mean. It's very clear. Our future depends on this. Our next generation will be intolerant um, if we are not ESG compliant. But apart from the stake, I mean, here's the carrot, because honestly, the financial returns are not bad. If you look at the global clean energy ETF versus the fossil fuel ETF, you will see an outperformance of some 200% over the last three years. So profitability and sustainability are no longer exclusive. That's the good news. Um, and then the what. Both uh, uh, Minister Indrani and Governor Anis talked about, you know, 
balancing the short-term, the long-term interests. Um, I liken this to being an ambidextrous leader. And I think all our politicians today have to, be, have to really display ambidextrous leadership, right? What are the short-term urgent issues, vaccination, COVID, and then the long-term interests around sustainability, ESG, clean energy, et cetera. So investing in infrastructure, it's not just the hard infrastructure like utilities, roads, but it's also the social infrastructure like what uh, 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 Indrani Raja talked about, caring for the elderly, caring about the community, caring about the pandemic. Um, the challenges are also around the availability and the reliability of the data, the measurements and attributions, the costs and the resources, and here the costs. I mean, technology is a great enabler but it can also be a great derailleur. When you have exponential growth in digital tech, meaning your costs can go down exponentially as well, that's fantastic. But what if you have signed up a 10, 15 year PPP based on an obsolete tech, right? And, and how do we work around those? So, and then there's obviously dif differences in awareness, capacity, knowledge, et cetera. And so the more we share together as a community, I think the more we can address these issues. Let me spend a little bit more time on the how, right? And the how, we talked a lot about public and private sector funding, blended finance, PPPs. Let me take a private sector prison to this. Commercial banks like DBS, uh, we link our own finance, financial backing, we link private, in, private investors, public investors, institutional investors. And the last time I checked, I mean, there's billions to trillions of dollars going into ESG, funds, sustainability funds, etc. Uh, we ourselves have committed to, to having uh, 50 billion in sustainable financing by 2024. Um, and here there are three or four prisms. The first as a bank is you can apply for sustainability linked financing, right? So these are a little bit more flexible. It's for working capital um, and it helps you to, to, to pivot. The second is you can issue bonds. The capital markets have become very, very ripe, and, and there's a lot of demand for, for such uh, ESG-compliant green bonds, blue bonds, social bonds, right? And then there is transition financing. So DBS came up with a framework because we recognize, particularly in Asia, it's very hard to go from brown to green overnight. You can't do that. You need to go from brown to light brown to light green, olive to green. And so coming up with this transition framework to help our customers with what I call the three Ds and the three Ts, right? The three Ds of divestment, decarbonization, and diversification. Um, and, and, and recognizing you need the three Ts, which are transparency, transition, and, and, and transactions, right? So bringing this transition finance to bear in Asia, to Asian society and Asian cities is, is paramount and quite useful. So there's a lot of demand, there's, there's the supply of capital. There's also innovation. Uh, uh, we've come up with a digital exchange. And whilst this is all very chunky investing, it is my hope that you know, with a digital exchange of some sorts, which we hope uh, uh, to, to bring, uh, we hope to bring infrastructural finance to, to, to the retail guys. If we can do this through you know, STOs, uh, tokenized uh, you know, ex, um, tokens, et cetera, I think that will be great. So what's needed, I guess, is for, for, for multilateral parties like us to work together, probably some clarity around defining what uh, sustainable infrastructure means. Is it clean water, wastewater, clean power, etc.? And also, I guess we need flexibility and speed. Um, I know that <laughs> some members of my team have been working on our project since 2017. Three and a, some of these projects do take a long time. I recognize the challenges, but hopefully with more multilateral uh, cooperation, we can speed up the process. We can bring in liquidity, transparency, consistency to the process. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for your insights. We are about halfway through our panel discussion. And the next section, I would like to ask uh, a few short questions and, and maybe invite each of the panelists to give uh, short interventions uh, to, to the questions. The first question, I would like to focus on the how. And as we uh, look at the question, um, I might also invite the organizers to flash some of the pre-event questions that we have uh, received to date. And the question is, how do we balance desired outcomes and trade-off 
and considerations. From our perspective, peacetime investments shape our capacity to respond to the times of crisis. Due to COVID-19, we've learned that there is a need to build in buffer to cater for the needs caused by disruptions, such as being able to come up with quarantine facilities in a very short time, and also being able to accommodate more work, play and study from home, or at least nearer to home on a semi-permanent basis. This adds to the complex task of coming up with infrastructure to cater for the changing needs and also building in capacity for growth. The challenge is to find a good balance between how much and also when. So the next series of short questions I'd like to ask to each of the panelists is perhaps I'd like to ask uh, first to Governor Anis. As the governor of a very important city, and also a steering committee member of the C40 cities, you see governors and mayors having to set the direction for the future and also the long-term goals, but also balance against meeting nearer-term needs. Can you share with us, uh, Governor Anis, some of the key challenges that you face or you see others face and what are the considerations for decision on the path to take? May I invite Governor for a short uh, intervention? Thank you, uh, Seth. So, it is indeed one of the biggest challenge is to find the balance on that long-term objective that we need to achieve. And on the, on the other hand, meeting immediate uh, expectations from the public. Now, let me also uh, add to that is when you are also uh, facing a situations where not, not majority of your residents put sustainability as the number one priority. That complicate the issues. So our approach is this. One, identify uh, allies. The youth, the millennials, uh, these are groups of, of our residents who cares about sustainability issues, who care about green approach, who care about uh, state of the art, the approach in building infrastructures that meet the needs of our city. So finding allies is key. Number two is uh, investing on public infrastructure that is in the main area of the cities and signify the message of sustainability. So uh, that has been some of our approach and then campaign uh, extensively. And that has of course uh, provoked uh, discussions within our, within our residents. Uh, in fact, let me give you an example. Uh, in the past uh, few weeks, we adopted a permanent uh, bike lanes in the in the uh, most uh, important, I would say, uh, corridor of the city uh, in the heart of Jakarta in our uh, downtown. And it has, of course, uh, provoked uh, discussions. And that is very fruitful, not only for our city, but also for city across Indonesia, that people started to talk about, you know, we need to put this agenda of sustainability, uh, of green approach into top priorities in our city because uh, these are challenges that the humanity is facing. This may not be seen as priority given the economic challenges, the social issues that has been caused by the pandemic. So if I may put it in short, find allies and then campaign hard put examples, and then you move from there. Thank you, Governor, for your sharing. Now, may I invite uh, Alfonso? You have seen uh, across the world how governments and private sector design and structure investments. Any big teams or good examples that you observe could be useful for emerging Asia? Yeah, <clears throat> so, I mean, yes, there are very good um, examples, and I think that um, also in Asia, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, good engagement of private sector and, uh, and public sector on, on designing solutions. No? But I think that what, what, what we don't have that much in Asia 
are cities that, uh, with the capacity to borrow from the private sector. And uh, which is something that I mentioned in my, in my introduction as well. No? And this is something be, beyond China and India that uh, have, uh, of course, done, done quite a lot. I'm, 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 I'm thinking more on emerging markets. No? Uh, this is an agenda that in Latin America, for instance, uh, they have done plenty of things related, and IFC has been uh, very active. Uh, for instance, in Bogota, in Colombia, uh, building the, uh, the, or helping to design the new transport uh, system of the city, or in Ukraine, or in South Africa, or in many other uh, Latin American countries. So, what I think is, as the governor was mentioning, we need to uh, focus and we need to target what is the objective that we believe uh, can be attractive for the private sector, can, be, can have a long-term perspective, and therefore needs some, I would say, patient capital. Uh, to come into this, uh, into this market and can be designed in a way where we can really uh, have the social objective and at the same time the uh, economic uh, uh, attractiveness. No? And there are many things. When you think about cities, what, what we are thinking is a huge menu of uh, issues no? from transport, waste management, uh, water sanitation, energy, uh, housing, affordable housing. So there are so many different things that I really believe that one of the things that, uh, that should be done, having or after having this defined the framework by which we allow cities to, in a way, optimize the capital structure or the financing structure that they can uh, deal with or that they can actually use to, to finance uh, the objectives, then decide what are the assets or what are the investment opportunities, the infrastructure opportunities that probably are better suited for capital markets, as uh, Susan was mentioning before, and, uh, and therefore require a different typology of a structure uh, versus those infrastructures that are probably more uh, short term and are more urgent and are more uh, and that probably will benefit more from a financing that comes directly from the central government or from the typical budget transfers. No? So I, we need to do some sort of a triage of uh, the uh, uh, objectives that we have as a, as a city, given all the different demands. And as the governor was mentioning, I mean, it's not, it's not easy to deal with the situation like, like, like the one that we have these days. No? The long-term uh, needs and, and, and objectives and pressure that we have to deliver and to make our infrastructure much more sustainable, and the short-term needs of uh, really uh, providing responses to the to the, to the, to the, to the immediate, immediate, immediate future. No? But I think that there are good cases. And again, I think that this triage, this planning, uh, is absolutely fundamental. We cannot just, uh, because, and actually every city is different. If you think about it, if I think about what Bogotá in Colombia did, it's totally different from, uh, from what we did in Ekaterini in South Africa, no? which was a totally different design because the needs of the city were totally different. And I'm sure that it will be completely different from Jakarta. So uh, that's what I think that uh, this type of uh, planning is absolutely fundamental when thinking on the optimal design. Thank you, Alfonso. Perhaps I now move to Gareth. Gareth, Mibana catalyzes and crowd in third party institutional capital, capital to look at townships and TUDs, as you mentioned. How did the COVID-19 affect your plans? And can you share some lessons with the, lesson, uh, with the audience? And where do you think are the opportunities of improving sustainability or resilience of urban infrastructure to deal with future shocks? Thanks, Seth. I think when we look at COVID, certainly it's been a game changer. Uh, as everyone has uh, highlighted. Uh, one of the major areas of impact to business, of course, was the you know, global disruption in air travel. Uh, as a platform that looks at many different geographies in Southeast Asia and South Asia, I think one of the things we had to adjust to was the ability to operate and continue operating without actually physically being be on site. And that has been a challenge because a lot of the developmental space, whether it's infrastructure or urban real, real assets, requires a lot of uh, hands-on. So I think we've had to adapt and to integrate a lot more of digital connectivity and infrastructure, how that supports the work that we do when we analyze projects, when we make investment decisions, uh, and even just communicating with our teammates all across the world. So I think that's one of the most immediate low-hanging fruits, especially as COVID-19 has become endemic in our society. And certainly the uh, increased demand for digital assets and connect connectivity will still be there. It's going to be increasingly more companies are going towards a work from home and work from anywhere arrangement. So that's one of the most immediate low hanging fruits. I think COVID-19, when it first happened and uh, global businesses started to slow down, we, we had opportunity to relook uh, at our business approach. We were fortunate that we were a new entity that was set up 
We had not yet deployed our capital, but interestingly, we managed to do so in the midst of the COVID pandemic because it actually reinforced our investment thesis and our priorities uh, when we look at mass market public housing and townships. I think Minister Indrani mentioned earlier that the impact and the fallout from COVID has been disproportionate and has been more profound on the lower to middle income segments of the population. And in a lot of instances, when we notice across uh, our projects, uh, in the event of a COVID pandemic, actually it was this segment of society that was uh, in a large part less accessible to whether it's healthcare services, amenities, uh, even food right, in a large part of the, uh, the equation. So I think our concept of creating townships with employment centres, economic centres in the urban fringe area, catering to the mass market, remains even more relevant in today's context. And how to ensure that your basic services, amenities, food supply continues uh, even during lockdown or movement control scenarios. Uh, so ancillary to that is also the uh, requirement for more logistics distribution networks. We think that that will continue to be uh, in high demand particularly those that are focused on cold chain or cold storage. We, we see there's a great need for, for, stock, for stock of uh, food supplies, medical, even vaccines. So that is another area that we think will, will continue to be in, in high demand. Uh, but one of the main areas that is posing quite a big conundrum for us is our promotion of transit-oriented or transport-oriented developments. I think as COVID has continued, I think it's, it's a big challenge of how to uh, reinstill public confidence in various public transportation options to basically get the public to still feel that it's safe to ride on various forms of uh, public transport. Just two days ago, Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City announced that they will suspend all the uh, buses and, and, and rail services. I think that's quite natural in the event of an uptick in the pandemic. But the future outlook is quite important in how we reinstill and, and move people back to public transport. Because in our mind, that's the only sustainable way to have mass movement of people in the long term. Right? So the shift towards making it safe, I think there is a lot of opportunity for using technology. We are trying to experiment putting that in into our projects, how we fulfill both the last mile and overall mobility as a service, trying to make sure that the public transport within the townships that we run and manage will be able to interact with larger regional municipal infrastructure uh, and making sure that it's actually the, the, the people, uh, the lower income people that actually need to take the transportation, that they have that safe uh, means to, to do so. Thank you. Thanks, Gareth. Looks like you're picking up the 10-minute walk to anywhere <laughs> in your regional townships as well. Certainly try, striving. Thank you. Uh, Shushan, could you share with us how banks like DBS are viewing ESG and sustainability link assets and also efforts that can help countries project towards this, uh, their own SDG goals? Uh, is this going to result in more private sector financing into certain parts of urban development? I think so. I mean, I talked about the avalanche of capital that we are now seeing, uh, whether it's you know, ESG compliant funds, infrastructure funds. I think there was some 96 billion raised last year in infrastructure funds. Uh, and, um, and with banks, I mean, you know, whether you want to access a, a commercial loan uh, or project finance, uh, structured loan, um, I do think that the ESG considerations have become so important that if you are not compliant sooner or later, you might be shut out of the funding market, right? Be it uh, uh, banks, uh, project finance or funds or capital markets. Um, and I think some of the key challenges right now that we've discussed, um, some of it is, is really the size of the projects that we're talking about. Uh, they can be very big, um, but I, 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 I'm optimistic that there is enough funding, but it has to be structured right. Um, the other is the tenor. You're talking 10, 15 years, and, and in between, you know, you've got, you've got all this tech technology that makes you know, old technology obsolete, what you do with that, or you have COVID, you know, if you finance an, an airport today and your volumes dried up, you know, how do you reframe uh, your risk return framework, right? Um, and then you've got to toggle risk and return, right? The good news is I think uh, in the renewable space, the price point is still or has come to a point where it is economically viable for private capital to invest. 
But when it comes to things like transportation, when you've got to think about affordability for your, your population, uh, and then you've got to be financially viable for your investors, how do you toggle that, right? Do you get the government to be a backstop always? Uh, do you have these multilaterals to help? Um, is it a volume game where you backstop a volume or is it a price game when you backstop a tariff? So there are all these considerations uh, to think about. Um, and I guess getting together and creating that sort of uh, best-in-class playbook, if you will, and incorporating some flexibility uh, into this playbook uh, would be very useful. Thanks, Shushan. Looks like we all have to put our brains together to create more dynamic commercial structures uh, to support the future of uh, growth. We have about uh, less than uh, 12 minutes left. Perhaps I'll jump on to the last question. Uh, for this short question this discussion and then, then we open up a few minutes for any other questions from the audience. Um, we have talked, learned a lot about from each of the panelists uh, the, their views about how to and also heard some of the successes that have uh, been um, seen whether in their, in their area or where they observe. The key challenge now is how to scale up such that uh, there are more successes. Um, and I would like to, I guess, perhaps ask each of the panelists to uh, respond to, to this, this prompt. Uh, we have uh, in advance received some questions, but as we look at the questions, I would like to set the stage. And this is, having singular successes is good, but being able to scale up would be great. In a world where data is more available, there's more scope to use a science-based approach there are also more opportunities for collaboration between the public and private sector. Um, the question to the panelists is, there are, as we saw success stories, but it is important to ensure that success is more prevalent and more pervasive. So what can or should we focus on in a world which has now needed, in a world which now needs more buffers and also a greater focus on just-in-case contingencies is technology, better use of data and digital tools an important component of the future of urban development? Or do you think there are other important levers that we should focus on? So it's a very rich question, but uh, we have about 10 minutes. Perhaps I, I could uh, invite uh, Governor Anis to share your views. Thank you. I think data and technology have made everyday life uh, easier. And in policy making, uh, technology and data help policymakers uh, develop policies based on science, based on fact and data, and representing the actual uh, conditions. So uh, I'd like to uh, share here our project on the uh, Jakarta Smart City and the creations of uh, an app called uh, Jaki that provide, it's a super apps that provide all information in a single access from price of uh, food uh, commodities for household to anticipations of weather. All of that in a, in a single uh, super apps. And what happened is with this, uh, we are able to interact much faster with our uh, residents. And when we have programs, public education is also much uh, wider. So the, the focus of this approach uh, has been to create a feeling of engage and that from our side, ability to absorb aspirations, problems in an immediate way. And I think this one way of, uh, of the approach that we have been uh, doing, and we have been able to create large uh, data so that many policies that we produce with regard to daily life of our uh, resident can be based on the feedback that we receive from those uh, data that we get from the applications. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Alfonso, any views? 
So on how to, to scale up, I think that two, uh, two different uh, ways that we could think about this uh, question. One, on the specific issues that we do, as the governor was mentioning, I think that technology is opening a space that was totally unthinkable, I would say, uh, two, three years ago. Related to transport, smart transport solutions that actually can make so much efficient the way that we manage uh, urban transport, but also on waste management, exactly the same, the use of data and the use of technology to uh, make it more efficient. Uh, in water sanitation, there are also very nice uh, experiences, but also on climate uh, resilience, so on, on adaptation, on, on thinking. Uh, for instance, we have uh, used drones in Tanzania no? to see what, what, what was the best uh, place to uh, do affordable housing and urbanization and trying to uh, predict what the uh, weather was, uh, was uh, what was happening, what was coming, uh, to avoid any potential uh, climate disaster. No? So there are many very good examples uh, that probably are very micro, uh, and we need to see how we can really scale up or at least think bigger on this on the use of technology. No? But beyond the specific issues, I think that there is a second piece uh, that we also need to think on how to scale up, which is what framework has worked better or is working better on uh, allowing cities to borrow from the private sector. Again, this is something that only a few cities in the world can do and probably not all the cities uh, are, uh, you know, have the conditions or the preconditions to go directly uh, to markets or to private sector to get financing. But I think that it will be good to really think on uh, what is the enabling framework, what is the framework that is needed and what are the results and what type of investments or infrastructure uh, are the ones that actually are suitable uh, to go to uh, uh, Susan for her financing together with us, IFC, or with whoever. No, but I'm saying, how, what, are the, what are the type of infrastructure that can really tap capital markets, whereas what is the infrastructure and uh, an investment in cities that should have a different way of uh, financing? No? So we need to think a little bit more structurally, I would say, and systematically on, the, on this agenda in order to scale it up. Very good observations. Gareth, any views? Thanks, Seth. I think definitely digital uh, and tools and data is very important in the, in the concept of uh, urban development and planning. In the early stages of conceptualizing and master planning, we use a lot of digital technology to aid us in our rendition and, and rendering and thinking through the applicable use of spaces. So I think that's a very key tool. The creation of digital tools, building information modeling, that has helped a lot in forecasting and predicting how the actual product uh, progress and scheduling can be done. Right. At the same time, I think uh, digital applications come in very critically for uh, applications in green monitoring. I think there's a lot of uh, roles that the built environment can, can contribute towards making sure that the right capital is being used appropriately. So we use digital technology to make sure that those uh, intended outcomes are actually being delivered. I think that only pertains mainly to the physical aspect and a lot of the digital tools can help us uh, in the digital space. Things that are palpable related to our, what we can see and what we can appreciate in our urban living and environment. At the same time, the non-physical, the more intangible aspects, things that we have discussed, social economic factors, which are just as important to empowering and ensuring long-term sustainability and resiliency, I think that needs a lot more of the human touch. A lot more of what we're doing today, a lot of like-minded parties coming together making sure that we can think things through uh, and making sure that the right capital can be allocated to the right areas. I think as Shushan was alluding, I think the private sector can play a large role in that, taking some of the first loss, first risk, trying to make sure that the uh, products are more bankable. Uh, and again, in that structuring, that's where the human element comes in, a lot more of interaction uh, and communication. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Shushan, your views? How to scale up? Well, I think, you know, use private sector capital to Gareth's point, right? There's enough funding here that will reward projects that are sustainable by making your financing costs lower. On the flip side is if you're not sustainable, then you sign up to a higher cost of funding. Um, I want to share an example that, that, that Gareth's team, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in Sabana Jurong did with my colleagues at DBS, which was we came up with the first sing dollar uh, sustainability link uh, bond earlier this year where the coupon would step up if they didn't meet certain requirements around their scope one or scope two emissions. And, you know, it was six times oversubscribed, which really showed the amount of capital that's out there that really are looking for some of these public sector type 
uh, investments that will show a commitment to being sustainable or building sustainable infrastructure. So I am optimistic that we can, we can create the demand and supply of these projects and make it cheaper and financially more viable uh, to be sustainable. Thanks. I think we have uh, just time for one question from the audience. I know a lot of questions have been streaming in. Perhaps I can invite the organizer to share a question. So the question is, would everyday people be able to participate in financing some of these sustainability or infrastructure projects and share directly in the economic opportunity? Looks like someone I know from. This is from DBS, or Wei Leung from DBS. <laughs> has this question. Thank you, Wei Leung. I guess I have to take it. <laughs> Um, well, I alluded to the digital uh, exchange. Uh, it is our dream um, that we will be able to tokenize, you know, create these uh, securitized tokenized offerings or STOs um, and, 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 and allow the wider public, you know, uh, not just institutions, but retail shareholders, small investors to invest in, this, in, 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 in these projects. Already there are ESG compliant funds, a lot of them. There are infrastructure funds which have been uh, trunched out into retail bite sizes. Um, and um, I, I think this is it's, 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 it's very nearly, we're very nearly there. I'm optimistic, as I said, that uh, the next generation, uh, the transfer of wealth that we're seeing now going from the first gen to the next gen, especially in Asia, is huge. And this new generation of investors are intolerant of non-sustainable projects. And so I, I'm optimistic that there will be a lot more retail funding going into this. Thank you, Shushan. Any final words from the rest of the panelists? I think I can add on a little sure. bit, Seth. I think uh, as what Sushan was saying, you know, as infrastructure projects become larger and require more capital expenditure, uh, I think a lot of local governments, uh, regional ones, municipals will have competing demands. Right? Especially in a COVID environment, a lot of focus on social delivery of outcomes. So I think the private sector participation and increasingly uh, as a stretch target for retail participation is certainly the way to go. The question is what tranche, what slice of risk can be accorded? Uh, I think uh, in Singapore, we are trying to experiment with some Singapore uh, dollar denominated government bonds. I think that's a good start. Uh, and I think it's a lot about how the private sector works to come together as well to anchor and deliver quality projects and structuring that right bankable projects uh, that are not just an empty promise, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel and that there are measurable outcomes along the way. I think the construction cycle has different risks and different appetite. It's about deconstructing it so that the right risks and liabilities can be matched to the right capital, as what Alfonso you were saying. I think there's a lot more potential we can do there, uh, you know, in terms of blended financing, green and blue bonds. So I, I'm, I'm happy to hear what DBS is working on and uh, certainly very bright future ahead. Yeah. Very... And if, if I may, if I add, uh, perhaps we must also choose project programs, policies or actions that do not simply give advantage for one sector or one aspect, but we must choose that give additional advantage and impact to other uh, sectors and aspect of, of urban development. So it's not really a single uh, area, but if, if possible, uh, we choose project programs that also provide side benefits uh, to other sectors. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have come to the end of this session. Uh, thank you, esteemed panelists, for joining us in this very rich discussion. I hope everyone have enjoyed it. I certainly have. I pick up one phrase, amphidextrous. Uh, I think in today's world, uh, we have to be amphidextrous. Government officials, uh, bankers, development finances, private sector. But I also picked up another word, multilateral collaboration. I think with all these new ideas, new tools, certainly we can conquer some of these challenges and also scale up the successes. With that, I thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Governor Anis Vaswedan, Mr. Alfonso Garcia Mora, Mr. Gareth Wong, Ms. Tan Su Shan, and thank you, Seth, for this insightful discussion. We also thank you, our audiences, both online and in person, for your attendance and for your attention. We have come to the end of this session. Playbacks of this session will be available in the virtual platform resource gallery in a few hours. 
Do catch our next session, our partner event with the International Finance Corporation, virtually on our conference platform at 12.10 p.m. Um, before you leave, we'd like to invite you to use the QR code or link to fill in our feedback form. Until our next session, thank you and goodbye. Uh